Next up, we have Stephen talking about um, radio telescope data transports. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Steven van der Vlucht. I'm working as a researcher in our high performance computing group in, uh, in Astron. Astron is a Dutch institute for radio astronomy. Um, so to today I would first like, you, like to explain to you what uh, radio astronomy is. And I'm, I will slowly take you uh, down into, uh, uh, w w into the world of radio telescopes. And in the end, I will address one of our biggest problems, which is uh, uh, radio, uh, which is uh, data transport uh, from our front end to our uh, uh, servers, where we actually process the data. Um, if you want a reference to any of the materials, I, in the end, I have a QR code which you can scan. You will end up at the Git page, which has the reference to everything, including the presentation. Um, so you're free to pick, take pictures in between, but you can also just take a picture of the last slide. Um, what is radio astronomy? So uh, you are probably familiar with uh, astronomy, uh, optical astronomy. You can do a bit by yourself. You can look at the moon, for example, and you can already uh, do some astronomy. You see the moon changing every day. Um, way back al already, people started building optical telescopes to do be able to do this a bit better with higher resolution. And we, uh, we found out that there's also uh, a lot of very interesting things to study in the universe. Um, in uh, radio astronomy, we look at a bit different part of the spectrum. So the, uh, in, in optical astronomy, you look at the observable light, uh, which happens to, uh, to propagate uh, through our ionosphere, ionosphere, luckily, most of it. Uh, that's why we have light. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but a big part of the radio spectrum is, is blocked. Yeah, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, X-ray and uh, 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 gamma rays are, are blocked, which is uh, luckily for us as humans. Uh, you have to go to space uh, with, uh, 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 and develop a satellite, uh, something like a Hubble or James Webb, to be able to study uh, th these kind of wavelengths. But there's also a big portion of the radio spectrum which does propagate to Earth, which is in the gigahertz to megahertz uh, uh, regime. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the part that we address uh, uh, with radio telescopes uh, uh, to, uh, to observe uh, phenomena. Now, wha wha what are these phenomena that we can see? Uh, quite a lot of different things, actually. So uh, there's uh, all kind of uh, uh, radiation being emitted by, by objects in the universe. Uh, for example, we can study the, 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 the solar bursts and uh, uh, the space weather. This way we can study the space weather from the sun, uh, which, which also affects us here at Earth. We can study things more, more closely by, like the ionosphere, meteors. Uh, we can study light lightning. Uh, but we can also look very far, far away. Uh, into other galaxies and uh, uh, things like supernova bla and black holes. So uh, radio telescopes have been around for a while, but not that extremely long, of course, because we needed the electronics first to build radio telescopes. Uh, it started off with, uh, with single-dish uh, radio telescopes, which could already tell us a lot about the universe. So uh, w one example is one of the oldest telescopes is the one that we uh, have in, uh, in Dwingelo. <coughs> Astron Dringelo radio telescope, known as Effelsberg here in Germany. Um, however, uh, the, the, the sources that we observe, they have long wavelengths and are very faint and far away. So we need big dishes and uh, uh, we need a large collecting area. <coughs> now, one of the, the, the things that was big in the, in the news is the uh, image of a, a black hole that was taken, one of the, the closest bias uh, black holes that we have. Uh, which is Sagittarius A star. Um, the, in order to take a sharp enough image of this object, they made calculations that they needed a radio telescope the size of the Earth, which is kind of impractical if it's a dish-based radio telescope. Um, however, we, we started in, in radio astronomy, people started thinking, okay, are there other ways that we can do this? And we came up with uh, uh, arrays of radio telescopes. So on the left is a system we have in Westerbork in the Netherlands. It's a, it's a synthesis array. Um, and the other is uh, uh, one of the systems in the, in the Atacama Desert uh, operated by, uh, by Alma. Um, so what we do with this kind of systems, you basically combine multiple sensors, yeah, like, uh, like you would have an array of microphones. You, com you compu computationally combine these sensors and you can get better sensitivity, better resolution. Um, the, the main techniques that we use here 
are uh, beamforming and interferometry. So uh, in between receivers, so a dish can have multiple receivers, but you can also regard a single dish as a receiver. So in between re receivers, we uh, apply beamforming. So we, we look at a certain portion in the sky, we create more sensitivity in that area, lose, of course, the information in the other area that, that we do not beamform. Um, this also gives us data reduction, which is, can also be a reason to do apply beamforming. And the other is that we apply radio interferometry. So we computationally combine signals from multiple dishes, meaning that we need the data from all of these dishes to be able to do that. So that can only be done in a central location. Uh, looking a bit from a uh, very high, high level at the radio telescope system, uh, a, a, an aperture array radio telescope, uh, we have uh, the uh, receivers at the front end. Wait, where's my light laser? We have uh, uh, receivers at the front end. These can be can be dishes, can be any other kind of receiver that receives radio uh, uh, signals of interest. We have to read out these receivers. That's where we're stuck with FPGAs and ADCs. Um, and we, uh, uh, if possible, we apply some pre-processing there already. So we can, for example, do beamforming to reduce the amount of data that we have to transport. Then we move the data to a central uh, location. Uh, where we do uh, where we apply correlation and beamforming, so that's where we computationally combine these signals. Of course, there's also lots of filtering and stuff. So we, we also want to get rid of RFI and other unwanted uh, signals. But the ma the main operation we apply here is correlation and beamforming. Um, yeah, I have a slide on that later. Zooming in, um, this is uh, still somewhat real time. Uh, and then we uh, uh, we go to offline processing where we have our intermediate data products. This also has to be done in the in scope of hours or days, because we cannot store the volumes of data that we're handling. Um, and after the, uh, this uh, uh, intermediate processing, we make the data available either to an archive or to a, uh, uh, an astronomer that requested a certain observation. Um, as Astron, we are uh, very broad in the institute. We develop everything from uh, uh, new antenna concepts uh, all the way up to actually analyzing the data with our astronomers. We do this for uh, all kinds of radio telescopes in the world. We do this also for other systems than ra uh, radio telescopes. But we also operate our own radio telescopes. And I want to take you along uh, uh, to give you an understanding of what a radio telescope is. I want to take you along in one of our, uh, one of our systems, which is called LOFAR. It's a low frequency array. This is a huge distributed radio telescope. So the, most of the uh, telescope is in, is in the Netherlands, but it's spread out over Europe to get both a good collecting area and to have long baselines. So the diameter of our system is uh, over 2,000 kilometers. We have um, uh, 38 uh, uh, stations. I will explain what a station is. We have 38 stations in the Netherlands and 14 spread out over Europe, and we are still expanding. So it's kind of crowdsourced. If you're a radio in institute in, another, in one company, uh, uh, a country in Europe, you can buy a station and you will get time on the uh, telescope. Um, we have to, uh, as mentioned, we have to move all this data to a central location in order to be able to process it. So zooming in, um, this is showing our, uh, our network across Europe. We, uh, uh, our data center is here in the northern part of the Netherlands. <coughs> So we, uh, we partially use uh, private network, but mostly we use uh, public networks. And zooming into the core, this is where you see many of our, uh, of our stations. And they connect to the, data s uh, the main data center through a concentrator node, which has the Ethernet uh, connections to the, to the public Ethernet, partially public Ethernet. Um, this does not look like a conventional radio telescope. It's not the dishes that I've shown before. So with LOFAR, we, uh, we opted for uh, 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 a low-frequency array because there was an interest to study low frequencies, uh, but also because we could design very uh, uh, cheap, expandable antennas. So we have uh, uh, small antenna poles, uh, which are mostly uh, uh, components that are, are cheap and expandable, and we have a lot of them, so we can also uh, uh, spare a few. So we have uh, uh, um, uh, low band uh, stations and high band stations. The high band look a bit different than the low band, but uh, this the concept is the same. We have a lot, and uh, they are uh, kind of cheap to build. Um, 
looking again a bit more from distance, so we, ha we have, we have the uh, two kinds of antennas that we read out. We have a station cabinet in the field, which uh, is already kind of a, uh, a compu computer. <laughs> uh, so it, it contains a lot of FPGA boards, uh, but there's a, there are also several servers uh, in this cabinet. Uh, one of the main challenges here is, uh, are the environmental conditions, for example, cooling stuff. Uh, then we go from these stations to the central processor. Uh, the uh, closest by station is around 70 kilometers, furthest away is about 1,000 kilometers. Uh, the data rates here uh, are, are currently 3 gigabits uh, per second from the station to the central location, but we're upgrading, and then we will go to 10 gigabits uh, per second. Uh, we ingest all this data in the central processor, which is where we uh, uh, correlate and beamform, and then later go to the offline processor. Uh, we also have uh, alternative modes. So here in the station, we already beamform, so we, uh, we reduce our data by at least a tenfold. Uh, but we also have modes where we want to have access to the raw data, which is uh, quite insanely large, um, and, and where we are really limited by technology. Um, well, why am I here at Orconf? Well, uh, I wanted to show an application of, uh, uh, of open source uh, hardware, software, anything open. Uh, and uh, I think our radio telescope is quite a, quite a great example. So we, we uh, uh, have our mechanics that we design with 3D printers. With me, uh, we can even print metal uh, uh, parts. We can uh, 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 create uh, molds, for example, those kind of things. Uh, partially so parts open source, uh, a lot is done in, uh, in, in public-private uh, partnerships and uh, European projects. Uh, we have open hardware, of which I have, I have uh, one example here in the, in the hallway, which is our, uh, our, our power sensor. Uh, we have open firmware, which my colleague uh, will explain about uh, after my talk. And we have open uh, software, but we also use a lot of open software. And the same holds for the hardware and, uh, and the firmware. So our, our, our idea is uh, we do this with public money, uh, so we also want to make uh, uh, pay back to the community as much as possible. Now looking into uh, one of the challenges we have is, uh, uh, which was also in the title, which is data transport. Uh, so we are currently working on uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet, uh, Rookie uh, version 2. <laughs> um, and why are we doing this? Uh, well. One of the biggest challenges is we, we, that we are facing is moving the data from our antennas to the central location. So currently it's about 10 gigabits, but we have fi more than 50 of these stations, so the ingress at the central location is rather high. Uh, but we are also uh, exploring te uh, developing technology for other systems where a single station produces 1.2 terabits of data and we have to use 400 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, we would like to use 1.2 terabit Ethernet, but that's not there yet. Um, we have to move this data into a GPU. We know that we can compute it there, but the challenge is to get the data into the GPU. Um, at the same time, we want to uh, co uh, use commodity components as much as possible. We are only a small institute. We, we built a one-off instrument, so we would like to buy what's available instead of developing it ourselves, if possible. Um, uh, but at the same time, we also prefer to do things open when, when that's possible. Uh, yeah, as said, uh, we want to stream the data from an FPGA into a server. Uh, in the server, we are mostly inter interested in the GPU. That's where we do our calculations. Uh, sadly enough, we uh, have to uh, deal with the NIC and the CPU and an operating system, uh, which is uh, causing uh, a bottleneck. So we, uh, we stream out UDP uh, over Ethernet. We, uh, uh, we don't care about retransmitting because we cannot keep the data on the, on the stations. And if we lose a bit of data, it's, uh, okay, it's too bad. We flag it, but it's not a big deal. Um, and uh, so, so the, the GPU can keep up with these kind of data rates. So PCI Express 4 can do 100 gigabit. PCI Express 5, we can do 400 gigabit. Uh, however, we have an operating system in between, which cannot handle these kind of data rates. It, uh, it bails out at uh, 40 gigabits. Um, so what we would like to do is we would like to skip the operating system and skip the, uh, preferably also the NIC, but that's quite hard. Uh, so uh, with remote direct memory access, we can at least skip the operating system and skip the CPU. Uh, the goals that we have here is to enable uh, uh, server-side uh, receive bandwidth beyond 40 gigabits per second. Uh, we see, so we see with basic UDP and, uh, and a normal NIC setup, we, uh, uh, we, we are limited to 40 gigabits. 
Um, at the same time, uh, even if we are stay below 40 gigabits per second, we RDMA would also allow us to reduce the load on the server. Uh, so if the, if the CPU is not loaded with handling the data, which can, uh, can help us to save power. Um, and the goal is to reduce power consumption of the total system. Um, we want to use commodity components, open uh, so, uh, software, hardware, firmware where possible. Um, and we are mo in, in sense of performance, we are most first of all interested in the good put, uh, secondly in the, in the CPU load, and lastly also in the energy, which are all, of course also all related. Um, there are several implementations available. Uh, however, none meeting what we uh, what we need. So we have quite a unique situation where we want to stream data, basically from an FPGA into the memory of a GPU. There are several RDMA implementations available, uh, but these are mostly point-to-point uh, uh, -point in, uh, uh, in in CPU systems, in a data center setup. So we we face we face large distances, and we have different kind of devices talking to each other. Um, quick recap. Uh, of, of how, uh, how data is handled at, uh, at the server when you're coming from UDP. Uh, all the way at the bottom, we have a hardware layer, so the data is received at the network card. Um, then we have the protocol layer, so we, we, are, we have UDP. Um, then uh, in, in Linux, the data ha ends up uh, in kernel space first, and then is later handed over to user space where the data is copied uh, to, uh, such that the user can access this data. Well, this is slow. There are alternatives. Yeah? <laughs> uh, so th that's, uh, that's this situation. Eh? So you go from user space to the other end in user space. Now, if you, if you apply some form of, uh, of remote memory access, you can, you can already skip the operating system and go to user space. But then still, we would need to copy the data from user space to a GPU. So that's an additional copy. Um, there's also, uh, at least for NVIDIA, there's the RDMA peer direct, which allows to directly go from a PCI Express device into the memory of a GPU. So that's what we would like to use. This is compatible with, uh, with InfiniBand. Uh, however, we don't want to use InfiniBand. Um, with, uh, uh, in Ethernet, there's uh, multiple options. They're uh, uh, based on the InfiniBand standards. So there's uh, uh, iWARP and there's uh, Rookie. We opted for Rookie. Um, and in the Rookie protocol, there is a, uh, a handshaking at first, so you, you set up a connection pair between uh, a sender and a receiver. Um, on the host side, you, you tell that there is a certain area of memory where the sender is allowed to, uh, to write to, and then you negotiate a uh, connection pair. Uh, and then the, the, the sending side needs to keep up with the addresses where it's wanting to write. Um, message uh, sizes can go up to two gigabytes. Uh, and only after this two gigabyte, the operating system is, is alerted that a message has arrived. So this drastically reduces the load on the CPU. <coughs> now we are implementing the, uh, this in FPGA because it was not there yet. Um, we have a uh, network layer already and we are adding uh, the Rocky V2 protocol to this. And uh, we are currently doing this uh, with Xilinx Elveo because that's what we had at hand. But we have an uh, Intel Agilex uh, board in order, which can do up to 400 gigabit Ethernet. So um, wrapping up a bit, what we, uh, where, where we are currently is, uh, we are currently at the state that we did an elaborate feasibility study uh, on the feasibility of applying RDMA in, uh, uh, for radio telescope systems for our use cases. So we. Um, uh, we did this between servers, so from CPU to GPU. Um, and uh, to be able to test the FPGA side, we first have to implement FPGA. So we set out, uh, set out on this course. Uh, we have uh, VHDL components now uh, simulated and partially tested with the AMD Alveo. Uh, this is a UDP network layer with packet pasting. And uh, we have started, we have now implemented a write only. Uh, operations for, for RDMA, and we will extend this uh, to, uh, multi, uh, to larger messages and to multi-messages. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what's here at the bottom. Um, in, in a couple of months, we will probably hopefully have a, uh, a board available to test this, um, but 400 gigabit Ethernet technology is not that easy to buy yet on the market, so we're still waiting on the receiver side. Um, so we, we first have to start with 100 gig, and then we can scale up to 400. That's it. If you would like uh, a reference, scan this. Cool, thanks, Stephen.
Probably got time for one question. One, one, one. Uh, do you do any, any, anything to synchronize clocks on the stations, between stations, make them coherent or any, any clock magic? Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, you haven't shown any back channel saying how do you perform coherence, coherent clocking? Well, we, we apply multiple things. We, uh, um, uh, the stations are equipped with GPS. Um, that Is it good enough? No. <laughs> Uh, in the Netherlands, we are now, now rolling out uh, um, White Rabbit, which is good enough. Is it good enough? <laughs> yes. Uh, and on the, on the remote stations, we can apply some tricks. So there are very accurate uh, uh, known phenomena, which are nowadays actually used to replace at, uh, atomic clocks. Um, so th there, are, there are phenomena called pulsars, which are at uh, are a certain interval uh, emitting uh, radio sources. And if we also take along one of these uh, pulsars in an observation, we can use that to synchronize uh, the stations together. Well, when, that's when at required. Uh, one ten centimeter, uh, one meter. Uh, w what wavelengths we are talking about? Me megahertz. Okay. Guys, we're running a bit over. Can I ask you to perhaps catch up with Stephen after the session to ask your questions? Cool. Thanks. All right. Let's thank the speaker again. Cheers, everybody. Thank you.